Hello, and welcome to Jordan Christian Center's annual 7 Last Sayings of Christ from the Cross. On behalf of Pastor Sam Hairston Jr. and the JCC staff, we thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for our Good Friday service. Tonight's guest speaker is Minister Aaron Keyes. She is a lover of all things fun, family, food, and God. Keyes aims to curate space for people to live out loud and reclaim their autonomy. Aaron Keyes graduated with a Master of Divinity degree in Theology from the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology in May of 2021 and a Master of Arts in Christian Education in May 2022. Aaron is currently the Assistant Director for the Stream Theological Youth Institute, Curator of Black Girls Theology, and assisting in a ministry build in the city of Richmond called the Ministry Church where the aim is to be a refuge and church for the unchurched. Amongst Aaron's greatest joys is sharing life and home with Micah and their two children, Audrey and Maya. Minister Keyes aims to live out loud so that others feel the permission to do the same. Sit back and enjoy as she shares with us the seven last sayings of Christ from the cross. As we gather today in this sacred place, I invite you to embark with me on a journey, a journey to the foot of the cross. Let us pause and remember the somber moment when Jesus, the Son of God, was crucified. His body was stretched out upon the rugged cross. His hands and feet were pierced by cruel nails. In a world marred by the inflation of costs but stagnant pay, social disparities, housing crisis, and escalating violence across the nation, let us reflect on the parallels between the turmoil of our times and the anguish felt by those who stood at the cross. Imagine the agony etched upon Jesus' face, the weight of the sins of humanity pressing upon his weary shoulders. As he endured unimaginable pain and suffering, let us sit at the foot of the cross with Jesus, bearing witness to his sacrifice and sharing in his anguish as we begin the journey through his last seven sayings. As we contemplate this scene, let us remember those who stood at the cross did not know of the redemption to come the victory over sin and death that will be won through Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. Let us hold this reflection in our hearts as we journey with Jesus through his final moments here on earth. As we gather around this cross, feeling the weight of its significance, we're invited to listen closely to the powerful messages Jesus spoke in his final moments. These words spoken in the midst of his suffering reach out to us today and they offer guidance and hope. In our exploration of a cry from the cross, we'll journey through the last seven sayings, discovering how they relate to our lives and faith. Together, let's unpack the meaning behind these words and allow them to shape our journey of understanding and growth. There is a cry for forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As recorded in Luke 23, verse 34. As we stand at the foot of the cross, we're met with Jesus' profound cry for forgiveness. A plea that reverberates through the corridors of time, challenging us to embrace radical grace and compassion. Jesus utters this profound plea. This statement challenges our conventional understanding of both accountability and culpability. It prompts us to consider the circumstances that may have shaped an individual's actions, acknowledging the possibility of ignorance or even misguidedness. Jesus' plea reminds us of the transformative power of forgiveness. Even in situations where understanding and empathy may seem scarce, we are called to extend grace and compassion to others, regardless of their perceived knowledge. This is, of course, recognizing that we too stand in need of forgiveness. Embracing this perspective allows us to cultivate a spirit of both humility and mercy, fostering healing in our relationships and communities. Let's look at how we can embody the empathy and the understanding that Jesus demonstrated on the cross. Let us challenge those around us to take a look at all of our actions and encourage further empathy in spaces where that empathy may be scarce. First, there's a power of pardon. 
Jesus' plea reveals the transformative power of forgiveness, urging us to release the burdens of unforgiveness and embrace reconciliation. In forgiving those who wronged him, Jesus demonstrates the depths of God's mercy and the possibility of restoration. By extending forgiveness to others, we not only free them from guilt, but also, and possibly a bit more importantly, we liberate ourselves from the burden, the shackles, and the bitterness that comes with resentment. When we embrace forgiveness as a way of life, it reflects the heart of Christ and fosters healing and reconciliation in our relationships and communities. The power of pardon then leads to a path of peace. Forgiveness isn't merely a transactional act. It is indeed a journey toward inner peace and healing, offering liberation from the weight of past hurts. As we extend forgiveness to others, we experience the profound release that comes from letting go of grudges and grievances. This path to peace requires courage, vulnerability, and confronting the pain of our wounds and choosing to forgive even when it feels undeserved. Next, we have the practice of compassion. Extending forgiveness reflects Christ's compassion, inviting us to emulate his example by extending grace to both ourselves and others. Jesus' act of forgiveness on the cross models radical love and empathy, inspiring us to respond with compassion in our interactions with others. Compassion involves stepping into another's shoes seeking to understand their perspective and offering both grace and mercy in place of judgment. Through acts of compassion, we actively participate in God's work of healing and redemption. So let us heed Jesus' cry for forgiveness, recognizing it is not only an act of compassion, but a pathway to personal and communal transformation. Through the power of pardon, may we sow seeds of peace and reconciliation in a world yearning for healing and restoration. The second word is a cry for salvation. Luke 23, 43 reads as such. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It is in the agony of the cross that Jesus offers the promise of salvation to the repentant thief, reminding us of the boundless mercy and grace extended to us all who turn to God in faith. This act of redemption amidst suffering serves as a beacon of hope, illuminating the darkest of moments with the promise of eternal life and reconciliation with God. While the scene at the cross may look bleak and sorrowful, this promise foreshadows the beauty that awaits, a beauty born out of Christ's sacrifice and God making all things work together for our good, the hope of a resurrection. In the depths of despair, we cling to the assurance that beyond the night of weeping, there is a dawn of joy. There is restoration that awaits those who place their trust in God. As we journey through the darkness that is Good Friday, may we hold fast to the promise that just as the night must yield to light, so too will our sorrows give way to the beauty of redemption. There is a few things to look at here. First, there's a promise of paradise. Jesus' assurance of paradise reveals the expansive nature of God and God's salvation, extending hope and redemption to all who seek it. This promise reminds us that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace and forgiveness. No one is beyond Jesus leaving the 99 to find the one. Regardless of our past or present circumstances, salvation isn't just about escape from punishment. It is indeed about restoration and renewal, offering a fresh start and a new life in Christ. By embracing the promise of paradise, we find assurance in the midst of uncertainty and hope in the face of despair. This promise calls us to trust in God's unfailing love and to live with confidence in the victory won for us on the cross. But how do we get to that promise of paradise? There is a pathway to redemption. Salvation, once again, isn't just about an escape from punishment. It's about the restoration, the renewal, and the fresh start in the new life of Jesus Christ. Through this sacrifice, Jesus opens the door of reconciliation with God 
paving the way for our redemption and forgiveness. This pathway to redemption invites us to turn away from sin and embrace the abundant life that Jesus offers. As we embrace the reality of our redemption, we experience the transformative power of God's grace, restoring us to wholeness and relationship with God. So what is this reconciliation? There is power in the reconciliation. The power of reconciliation is indeed embracing the salvation that reconciles us back to God and to one another. This new relationship is marked by both grace and love. And through Jesus' sacrifice, the barriers of sin and separation are broken down. We are invited into a restored relationship with God. This, res this reconciliation calls us to extend grace and forgiveness to others, just as we have received it from God. As ambassadors of reconciliation, we embody the love of Christ in a broken and divided world, working to bring healing and restoration to relationships and communities. This is the work of not only restoration and reconciliation, but bringing the kingdom of God here on earth. As we contemplate Jesus' promises of as we contemplate Jesus' promise of salvation, may we embrace it with humility and gratitude, trusting in the boundless love of Jesus. Let us respond to his invitation with repentance and faith, knowing that in him we find true freedom and eternal life. Amen. The third word is a cry for relationship. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. John 19, 26 through 27. In his final moments, Jesus tenderly entrusts the care of his mother to the beloved disciple, underscoring the importance of community and kinship in our journey of faith. Mary, who gave birth to Jesus as just a teenager, nurtured and raised him with a mother's love and a mother's devotion. Their bond forged through years of shared experiences and mutual affection exemplifies the depth of love between mother and child. As Jesus hangs on this cross, his concern for Mary's well-being highlights the intimate connection they share. Transcending the agony of his suffering, he looks out for his mother. This act of entrusting Mary to John not only demonstrates Jesus' compassion for his mother, but also symbolizes the formation of a new family unit, a family unit within the community of believers. Through this meaningful exchange, Jesus reveals the profound significance of familiar relationships and the importance of caring for one another as members of one family. We experience sacred connections in this family. Jesus' act of entrusting Mary to John highlights the sacred bond of family and community. We are reminded of the significance of relationships in our spiritual formation. Let us not forsake the assembly of saints. Their exchange at the foot of the cross emphasizes the importance of nurturing and supporting one another within the family of believers, creating a sense of belonging and unity. Next, their spiritual siblinghood. As children of God, we are called to cultivate relationships characterized by love, support, mutual care, and embracing one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. This spiritual siblinghood transcends biological ties, creating a bond of kinship grounded in our shared identity as children of God. We do indeed have a shared responsibility. Just as Jesus entrusted Mary to John, we are called to share the responsibility of caring for one another, offering compassion, encouragement, and, and practical support in times of need. This shared responsibility fosters a culture of solidarity and compassion within the community of believers, reflecting on the selfless love of Christ in our actions toward one another. Let us cherish and nurture the relationships that sustain us, following Jesus' example of love and solidarity. May we embody the spirit of kinship and community. May we foster environments where all are welcomed, supported, and valued as beloved children of God. The fourth word, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? This is indeed a cry out from the feeling of abandonment. 
In this cry of abandonment, Jesus gives voice to the depths of human suffering and anguish. Jesus offers solace and solidarity to all who have felt abandoned or alone. This powerful expression of vulnerability resonates with our own experiences of hardship. When we question God's presence and feel forsaken in our darkest moments, yet in Jesus's cry, we find reassurance that even in our most profound despair, we are not alone. Our pain is understood. Our pain is understood intimately. Jesus's cry from the cross serves as a beacon of hope reminding us that God is present with us, even in our moments of doubt and abandonment. Through Christ's own experience of forsakenness, we find comfort in knowing that Jesus walks alongside us in our trials, offering steadfast love and companionship. As we reflect on this cry from the cross, we find strength and assurance in the presence of a God who never leaves nor forsakes us, even in the midst of our deepest struggles. This cry shows profound pain. Jesus' cry from abandonment speaks to the profound pain of feeling forsaken, reminding us that even the Son of God experienced the depths of human suffering. In this moment of vulnerability, Jesus identifies with our struggles and offers a glimpse into the raw emotions of both despair and isolation. In this cry, there is a presence of pain. In our moments of despair and loneliness, we find comfort in the assurance that the same God who is with us on the mountaintop is the same God that's with us in the valley. The same God that knows the amount of hairs on our heads is the same God that calls us out by name and cares deeply for us. This unwavering presence sustains us through the darkest of nights and offers both hope and strength to endure. Lastly, in this cry, there is a promise of presence. Though we may feel forsaken at times, we're reminded of God's promise to never leave us nor forsake us. We are sustained with God's unfailing love and faithfulness. Even when our circumstances seem overwhelming, we can trust in the enduring presence of God, the same God who walks alongside us in every trial and tribulation. This promise of divine companionship brings solace and reassurance, reminding us that we are never alone, for God is Emmanuel, God with us. And God will indeed continue to show up in every circumstance that may seem and look bleak and forsaken. As we reflect on Jesus' cry from abandonment, may we find hope and comfort in the presence of a God who draws near to us in our darkest of moments. May we cling to the promise of God's steadfast love, knowing that we are never alone. For God is Emmanuel, God with us. is a cry out from suffering. Two simple words, I thirst. John 19, 28. In Jesus's declaration of thirst, there's a, an acknowledgement of humanity and vulnerability. We are invited to find strength and solace in Jesus's empathy and understanding of our own suffering. This moment of raw humanity from the Son of God reveals his deep connection to our own human experience demonstrating that he understands our physical and emotional needs intimately. Through his thirst, Jesus shares in the common struggle of human existence. He reminds us that he's not that distant or disconnected. Instead, he's fully present and engaged in our lives. As we contemplate Jesus's cry for relief, we are reminded that even in our moments of physical or emotional thirst, we can turn to him for comfort and support. His vulnerability on the cross serves as a beacon of hope, assuring us that as he walks alongside us in our own struggles, he offers strength and compassion to sustain us. Ultimately, Jesus' cry for thirst points to his humanity and solidarity with us, reassuring us of his unwavering love and understanding in the midst of our own troubles. We see two major points here on the cross. There's an invitation to empathy. In our moments of suffering and thirst, we are invited to draw near to Jesus, who understands our pain and intimately and offers us comfort, compassion, and strength to endure. His cry of thirst serves as an invitation for us to share our burdens with him, 
knowing that he empathizes with our struggles and is present to comfort us in our time of need. Through prayer and reflection, we can bring our deepest desires and concerns to Jesus, trusting in his promise to provide us with the strength and sustenance we need to persevere. In embracing our own vulnerability and seeking solace in Jesus's companionship, we discover a deep sense of connection with our Savior. This invitation to empathy encourages us to extend the same compassion, grace, understanding, and mercy to others who are experiencing thirst and suffering. This embodies the love and grace of Christ in our interactions with one another. Next, there is an inspiration for action. Jesus' cry for thirst compels us to respond with compassion and solidarity to the suffering of others, quenching their thirst for love, healing, justice, through acts of kindness and mercy. Jesus' vulnerability on the cross serves as a powerful example of selflessness and sacrifice. We should be motivated to emulate his love and generosity in our own lives. As followers of Christ, we are called to be agents of healing and reconciliation in a broken and hurting world. Reaching out to those who are marginalized and oppressed with the transformative power of God's love. By responding to the needs of others with empathy and compassion, we participate in God's redemptive work. We bring hope and restoration to the lives of those who are suffering. Inspired by Jesus' cry of thirst, we are empowered to take action in addressing the root cause of injustice and inequality, advocating for the rights and dignity of all people. As we meditate on Jesus' cry from suffering, may we find solace in his presence and strength in his empathy. Let us respond with compassion to the cries of the thirsty and hurting around us. May we embody the love and grace of our Savior. The sixth word is a cry toward victory. It is finished. John 19, 30. In his triumphant declaration, it is finished. Jesus proclaims the completion of his redemptive work, ushering in a new era of victory and hope for all who place, his, who place their trust in him. This powerful statement signifies not merely the end of Jesus's earthly life, but the fulfillment of God's plan for salvation. This is accomplished through Jesus's sacrificial death on the cross. The phrase, it is finished, conveys a sense of finality and accomplishment. It indicates that Jesus has fulfilled all the prophecies and requirements necessary for our redemption. However, it is important to note the distinction between finished and done. While Jesus' work on the cross is finished, our journey of faith and discipleship is ongoing. This declaration marks the culmination of Jesus' earthly ministry and mission. But it also marks the beginning of a new chapter in God's redemptive story. As we are invited to, to participate in the ongoing work of spreading the gospel and making disciples, we reflect on Jesus' words, it is finished. Let us embrace the assurance of our salvation while also recognizing our responsibility to live out our faith and share the good news of Jesus's finished work with others. There has been completion at the cross. Jesus's declaration signifies the culmination of his mission on the cross. And as he conquers both sin and death once and for all, he secures salvation and eternal life for all who believe. With Jesus's cry toward victory, the power of condemnation is broken and we are liberated from the guilt and shame of our sins. As we are declared righteous and forgiven through Jesus' atoning sacrifice, the triumph here we find cause for celebration and rejoicing. As we stand on the victorious side of the cross, we are heirs of God's kingdom and co-heirs with Christ in his eternal glory. This proclamation of it is finished calls us to embrace the reality of our own redemption and live of people of hope confident in the victory won for us by Jesus. There's a celebration of conquest. In Jesus' triumph, we find calls for celebration and rejoicing. We stand on the victorious side of the cross, heirs, of Jesus's, heirs with Jesus and to God's kingdom. This celebration of conquest marks the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. We are reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ. As we reflect on this victory over sin and death, we are invited to join the chorus of praise and adoration, proclaiming the greatness of our God and the magnitude of his salvation. 
This celebration calls us to live as people of joy, sharing the good news of Jesus' victory with a world in need of hope and redemption. So come, let us rejoice in the victory won on the cross. Let us embrace the fullness of redemption and restoration available through Jesus Christ. As we behold this finished work, may we live in the reality of Jesus' triumph. May we share the good news of salvation, and may we remain victorious in a world that is in need of hope and renewal. The seventh word, God, into your hands, I commend my spirit. In his final surrender, Jesus commends his spirit into the hands of God and embodies the ultimate act of trust and surrender, even in the face of death. This profound moment encapsulates Jesus's unwavering faith and obedience to the will of God. As he submits to the divine plan for redemption of humanity, he entrusts his spirit to God. Jesus demonstrates his complete reliance on God's sovereignty and provision even as he experiences the agony of the cross. This act reflects Jesus' profound intimacy with God as he acknowledges the eternal bond between them and submits himself fully to God's care. Through Jesus' example, we are reminded of the importance of trusting our lives and futures into the hands of God, trusting in God's wisdom and goodness to guide us and sustain us. As we contemplate Jesus' final surrender, may we also surrender our own lives into the loving hands of our most gracious God in heaven. May we find peace and security in God's unfailing love and faithfulness. This act of commending Jesus' spirit back to God serves as a reminder that even in our most difficult moments, we can rest assured that God is with us, holding us securely in God's own hand and guiding us into eternal life. Jesus commending his spirit into God's hand reflects his unwavering trust and confidence in God's faithfulness and sovereignty. Even in the midst of uncertainty and suffering, this act of surrender demonstrates Jesus' profound belief in God's perfect plan and in God's ability to bring about redemption and reconciliation through Jesus' sacrifice. By entrusting his spirit to God, Jesus reveals his complete confidence that God will fulfill the promises and bring about the victory over sin and death. This expression of trust serves as a powerful example for us, encouraging us to place our full confidence in God, God's providence, and God's goodness, even when circumstances look chaotic. There is a call to surrender here. Jesus' cry to commend his spirit back to God invites us to follow his example of both surrender and trust. We are called to release our fears and anxieties onto the loving care of God, knowing that our lives are completely in God's hands. This act of surrender requires both humility and faith. As we relinquish control and place our trust entirely in God's guidance and provision, we give God the authority that already belongs to God. We're able to find peace and security in that unfailing love and faithfulness. Jesus' call to surrender is a reminder that we are not alone in our struggles. Instead, we are held securely in the hands of a loving and a compassionate and an understanding God who cares for us deeply. As we contemplate on this final cry, let us emulate Jesus' profound trust and surrender, entrusting our lives into the hands of the one who holds all things together. May we find peace in the assurance of God's presence. May we find peace in the assurance of God's provision. May we know that we are held securely in God's love, both now and for eternity. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have had a great time in the Lord. And I want to thank Minister Keys for proclaiming Jesus' word from the cross. And we want to thank you all for tuning in tonight and worshiping with us. We don't want to assume that everyone who tuned in tonight is saved. So if you were moved by the sacrifices Jesus made on the cross for you and me, and you now want to give your life to Christ, just do as Romans 10 and 9 says. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. After that, I beg you to connect with the Bible believing and Bible teaching church to help develop you into a disciple of Jesus Christ. Here at Jordan Christian Center, we stand ready to receive you and walk with you on this new journey. Our contact information is on the screen, so if you desire prayer or just became a new convert, 
or want to become a part of our growing ministry, please reach out to us and we will respond in kind. May the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in us henceforth and forever. As we leave this mode of communication, but never his presence, I pray that God goes with you. Be blessed.